everyone, and welcome to episode 231 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobolski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Have you ever found yourself wanting to give the everyday bits of your life a little boost? Maybe said a few words that you hoped might help make that happen? A lot of us carry snippets of rhymes or word formulas in our minds that stretch back through generations and are meant to smooth our way through life. Some of us carry little talismans in our pockets, on our bodies, or on our keys. In the Middle Ages, people were just as interested in hedging their bets when it came to the slings and arrows of everyday life. And like us, they enlisted the help of charms. This week, I spoke with Dr. Catherine Storm Hindley about charms in the Middle Ages. Catherine is Assistant Professor of Medieval Literature at Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, and the Director of the London International Paleography School. She's the author of many articles on medieval literature, manuscripts, and words. Her new book is Textual Magic, Charms and Written Amulets in Medieval England. Our conversation on charms, who used them, how they used them, and what the medieval church thought about all this is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Catherine, for joining me to talk about charms. I know this is going to be a super fun conversation. So thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, my pleasure. So we need to start with what is a charm? Because you had to sort of pin this down to even start the book that you wrote. So what is a charm in your definition? Well, yeah, as you say, it's a complicated question. I ended up with a a definition that was slightly messy, So it's either spoken or written words that aim to have a practical effect on the world. So most of the ones that I'm looking at are used for healing purposes. So words that you would say or that you would write down and interact with in some way that would stop you from bleeding or ensure safety in childbirth or cure a fever or whatever whatever purpose the charm might have. The difficulty really is in separating them from prayers, which in the book I tried to do by looking mostly at the manuscript context. So I am not sure that there's a clear definition in medieval usage between a charm and a prayer. But so I was, I was trying to say if something, if it's in a medical compilation where everything around it has a practical purpose, then I'm more likely to include something as a charm. Whereas the same thing appearing in a purely religious collection without a specific practical purpose specified, I would count as a prayer. So the same text if framed in different ways by its scribe and by the manuscript context, might appear as a prayer or as a charm, which made things difficult when I was collecting my data. <laughs> well, it's, a, it's an important thing to, to make a distinction about because I think that when people think about charms, they think about magic and they think about it being just automatically separate from religious practice. But in the Middle Ages, these are much closer together, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, almost every single one of the charms that I maybe that's an exaggeration, but certainly the vast majority of the charms that I found are explicitly religious. So they're referring to Christian narratives, they're using Christian words of prayer, and they might be using them in slightly different purposes, and they would be used in church, but they're certainly, they see themselves as being part of ordinary Christian practice. Yeah, and this even extends to some of them being meant to be used by actual priests as well, right? Yeah, Not a huge number, but yeah, there are certainly some. And there are some which at least require the priest to cooperate. So there's (laughs) there's ones where you take candles to church and you ask the priest to pick a candle. And the candles have the names of the days of the week written on them. And the candle the priest picks is the day that you, I think that's the day that you then fast for the rest of your life. And there's, there's some way you have to put ingredients under the altar. And so that sort of suggests if you're hiding something under the altar that the priest would be able to see that, I'm guessing. <laughs> so it has to at least not throw it away <laughs> once they find it. And then others which require you know, communion wafers, things like that. So using things that the church, church spaces and church materials that are incorporated into the charms. Right. So it's not so separate that people are nervous about charms at the outset like not every charm is going to make people nervous that they are doing something occult right how many people would you say are using charms is this something that everybody is using on the everyday or it's just something that you'd use every once in a while how frequently do you think people are using charms i think probably very frequently so i have examples recorded in books that were used by 
you know, the case of very high status manuscripts. I have ones that are used by professional doctors. There are some that are in just kind of household books. I'm sure that lots of them circulated orally, so they would have been used by, you know, anybody who knows them. Some of them, I've got this one example of a, a medical recipe to stop bleeding. And the recipe is specifically for if the charm didn't work, here's the next thing that you can try, <laughs> suggesting that the charm is the first thing that you do. So I suspect they were incredibly common. And because we only have the written record of them, obviously, we, we're only seeing a certain subsection of the population, you know, people who were literate enough to write the charm down for us to have it today. But I think they would be as widespread as you know, a nursery rhyme or something like that. So when you found them in the source books and you found them, as you say, all over the place, maybe we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. Where did you find these charms then? Let's just ask that question at the outset. Where did you find them? So I, for the earlier chapters in the book, I tried to look at everything I could get my hands on. So I, I went through the hand list of Anglo-Saxon manuscripts and just looked at anything which said it was to do with medicine or said it contained a charm. I went through you know, the hand lists of Anglo-Norman, again, trying to pull out anything that said it was medicine or a charm. Latin was more difficult because there's so much of it and there's not, to my knowledge, an easy hand list. There are some databases, so the, the Electronic Voice Cuts database and the Thorndike Kyber, which lists database including sort of medical manuscripts and, and charm texts. I think one of them specifically lists manuscripts, including charms. So I was looking at all of these resources that are telling me where charms appear and then also published charms, looking at the manuscripts that contain them to see what other charms are in there because they rarely occur alone. So if you have one charm, you probably have others. And then, and then I just sort of sat in the library for, for you know, <laughs> a year or two, <laughs> reading cover to cover of these manuscripts and writing down any charm that I could find. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think that sort of goes to show that you find them everywhere. So you find them in medical books and you find them, and you've, you've even found them sort of written around things like people have just kind of scribbled in a charm. And then oh, yeah. that gives you the the challenge of figuring out when this was written, was it written at the same time or later or, you know, have to examine the handwriting for something like that, I imagine. But yeah, when you're looking at a charm, what kind of phrasing are they using often when you see one of these so that you recognize it as this is something that somebody needs to say or write somewhere in order to make something happen? The first thing that I would generally spot is not even phrasing, it's crosses between the words. Mm -hmm. So that's not every charm by any means, but if you open a page and you have a little sentence with a cross between every word in the type of book that's likely to include a charm, that's often going to be one. In another type of manuscript, it might be a prayer, as I said, that, that definition is confusing, but that's a big flag <laughs> for something being a charm. Um, sometimes the heading will specify that it's a charm, particularly for spoken charms. So it will say, you know, a charm for fever mm -hmm. rather than just you know, a medicine for fever. And then otherwise, yeah, it's just the, the kind of simple instruction. So write this or say this in whatever language the manuscript's in. So English, French, Latin, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I do want to get into language in a minute. But one of the things that I found surprising when I was reading your book was that a lot of the time you were saying most often charms are being used by a practitioner, the person you're calling a practitioner, instead of the mm -hmm. actual patient, the person who needs that help. So can you tell us a little bit about this difference between saying it yourself and having someone else say it? What do you think the reason for that might be? First of all, partly I was using the term practitioner because it's often not entirely clear who would be performing it. Mm -hmm. So practitioner was my way of trying to get around having to say that it's you know a doctor or the patient because you don't know. Often the manuscript will just tell you for fever, say these words, and mm -hmm. you can't tell. There are a couple which clearly would have been said by the patient. So there's one which includes the phrase, deliver me of my child, mm -hmm. which you know, that's going to be the woman in labor saying that. But for most of them, it's unclear. Sometimes it definitely isn't the patient. Practitioner was my way of getting around having to specify. <laughs> I think part of what's happening is that it's not actually important for the patient to understand the words. Mm -hmm. So it's the words are powerful in their presence whether that's written or whether that's spoken. And so 
somebody needs to say the words, but they don't have to be understood. And so they can be said on behalf of somebody else. There are some that you can say at a distance from the patient. Mm -hmm. I think the charm is being directed at the patient, but not necessarily needing to be understood by or spoken by the patient. For a written charm, it usually needs to be in contact with the patient, usually. Mm -hmm. So it does have to be, often has to be nearby or in physical contact. (laughs) <laughs> but it's not being written down by the patient usually, or it certainly isn't specifying that it should be. It's a slippery thing, as are all of yes. these charms, like trying to define them. I mean, a heroic work that you've done in this book, but you open it by talking about a man named Roger, who was an unfit practitioner <laughs> of <Yes>. using <laughs> these charms. Can you tell us a little bit about Roger and what, what the issue was with his use of charms? Yeah, so he gives a charm to a woman and it doesn't work. And so the woman and her husband open it up and inside is not the text that he said would be there. And so he gets kind of called into court and asks what the text says and he gets it wrong. (laughs) And so so then he's being accused of not being a real (laughs) doctor. But so the issue there, I think, is that the record that we have of this trial is complaining about him not being literate. And so the the issue is his kind of lack of understanding of the words that he's using. And so as a patient, you don't necessarily need to understand the words, but as a practitioner, he's the one who's deploying those words. And you see in, in other texts, you see concern about people using words that they don't understand. The fear seems to be that you, rather than summoning something that will help somebody to heal, you might accidentally summon a demon or cause harm mm-hmm. because you don't know what the words are actually doing. So they sort of want chance to be used by people who are responsible and knowledgeable. Yes. Well, I think that's a really important point to pull out because I remember looking at stuff, medical stuff for another thing I was doing, and it was talking about (laughs) midwives and how if a baby is in danger, they can Mm -hmm. speak words to baptize this baby. And during the Black Death, also, you have people who are allowed to give the last rites, even if they don't understand the words. The Pope was mm-hmm. saying, you know, it's fine, just do your best because God will understand. And it's it's interesting because I think one of the things that you trace in your book, and you can correct me if I've got this wrong, is that people were much more relaxed about understanding the words earlier in the Middle Ages, and then they got really a little bit more uptight about this because they were more concerned that they were going to cause harm. Is that an arc that you saw? Yeah, that's my sense. So I don't see people explicitly complaining about understanding or trying to prevent people from seeing the words of the charm until later, Mm -hmm. which in terms of the charms that you would have to write down, I suspect is to do with increasing literacy. So more of a fear that uh, a patient might be able to open the charm up and copy it, share it. And so maybe there's some aspect of doctors and practitioners trying to preserve their specialized knowledge, mm-hmm. particularly with the written charms, where you have to at least have some level of education to be able to write the charm down, you know, to copy the text, you have to be literate. Whereas spoken charms are probably circulating much more freely because the barrier to entry is so much lower. It's true. And when you think about this being a practice that a doctor, for example, gets paid for, is paid to do Mm -hmm. these charms or create a charm, a written charm or something like that, you can see why they'd want to have some proprietary control over it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. There's one charm that within the words of the charm, it tells you that you shouldn't charge for it. You should freely say it. Mm -hmm. And you notice that phrase dropping out in later copies. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody's got to make a living, I suppose. Exactly. (laughs) We've all got to eat. (laughs) So speaking of access to these charms, you notice a big difference between the spoken charms and the written charms. And that is the big difference seems to be language. So can you tell us about Mm -hmm. the language that people are using in their spoken charms versus their written charms? Yeah. (laughs) So this was very much not what I expected to find. But in the spoken charms, people use all kinds of languages. So Latin, you get a little bit of Greek, you get some sort of gibberish that has no apparent meaning. You get English, you get French. And the spoken charms, as the vernacular in England changes, so after the Norman Conquest, you very quickly get charms in French. As people shift back to using Middle English, the charms shift into English. So the the spoken charms are very much following the normal patterns of what languages people are using in their daily life, it seems. Whereas the written charms really don't do that. So they almost never appear in the vernacular languages. So they're using Latin, Greek, 
gibberish <laughs> um, or, or, or sort of visual gibberish, I guess, like invented alphabets things that sort of look like writing, but aren't legible to us, <laughs> but to the kind of ordinary human eyes. In the in the very late Middle Ages, you start to see a little bit of vernacular creeping into the written charms, but only right at the end, and it's still very rare. So during the Middle Ages, I think there really is this distinction that the vernacular works in spoken charms or, or is kind of appropriate for spoken charms, but is not appropriate for written charms. Mm-hmm. Do you think that this has something to do with more concern over things like witchcraft so that people are thinking about what sort of charm are you saying over me? I want to be able to know what this is. Do you think that might have something to do with using more vernacular when it comes to, so vernacular being the regular languages people are using. Do you think that this maybe has something to do with some concerns over witchcraft? Because that is obviously heating up more into the early modern period than it was during the Middle Ages. I'm not sure because it's, I mean, it's switching into English for the written charms, Mm -hmm. but I, I I haven't seen enough evidence to make this argument and (laughs) necessarily stand by it. (laughs) But my feeling is that it's to do with the translation of the Bible into English, Mm -hmm. because the ones that I, that I've seen, and as I said, there's very few, but they're, they're often using the standard translation like they're using whatever the kind of current translation of the Bible into English was, the, like the authorized version of the time, mm-hmm. even as they're being condemned as sort of Catholic superstition. So they're using the English Bible. So they believe in the version of the Bible that the post-Reformation church is putting out. But they at least are willing to draw on its power. Mm-hmm. But at but the that- same time, the people who are recording them tend to be recording them as, you know, look at this horrible Catholic superstition that, <laughs> you know, we good Protestants <laughs> should ignore. At some point, I would quite like to look for more charms in the you know the Renaissance material to try and check: am I right, <laughs> or am I just you know making something up on the basis of a few examples? I mean, to be fair, you looked at over a thousand, so <laughs> I think that you know <laughs> but they were all earlier, <laughs> you've, you've, later as well for comparative purposes. You've made a good start, though. <laughs> There's time. Yes. There's it time to begun. extend it. <laughs> so when we're talking about written charms. Let's talk about this a little bit more because there are different things that you can write on and the writing itself seems to be what gives it power. You compare this to relics. So maybe what we can get into now is talking about how these work sort of in the same way as relics and what kind of objects people will inscribe with charms. The comparison with the relics, one thing that I should be clear about is that I don't necessarily think that somebody in the Middle Ages would have argued that they're working in the same way. So Mm -hmm. what I was noticing in the book is that fairly often you'll have them described in parallel. So like a charm or a relic, somebody will will kind of make the same argument about both. But I haven't really found sources that are theorizing the way that charms work in the way that they theorize the way that relics work. So I I want to be kind of tentative about the, the connection that I'm drawing, but I think that people who are using charms are creating their practices, developing their practices in line with what's happening with relics. So there's some sort of cultural assumption that these two things are working in parallel, but I don't know that they would have outright said it. Yeah. And when I'm saying that, what I mean is that a lot of the types of interaction that you see people have with relics and with charms are similar. So you might want to carry a relic around your neck. You do that with a charm that you want to have contact with the relic, that you can sort of dip relics in water and that will sanctify the water. You can do that with a charm as well. So the text, as the text sort of washes off the the parchment, it empowers the water. Mm -hmm. You know, you have those records of people sort of eating bits of you know stuff that have been around the relics and people will do that with charms as well so those kinds of interaction are similar Mm -hmm. and then the ones that I really like are I think that sometimes the written charms are standing in for relics so for example there's a charm where you write the name of Saint Nicasius and if you just have his name written on a piece of parchment it sort of stands in and does the same thing as his relic would Mm -hmm. So, you know, his, his relic would protect you from pox, but his written name will also protect you from pox. So it's not, I think, that it's creating a relic, but it's making a sort of stand-in for a relic, something that can serve the same purpose. And so the name, the written name is giving that piece of parchment or it's 
I think that was actually written on a root of something I can't remember <laughs> but it's giving that material some some kind of power equivalent to the actual remains of the saint mm-hmm. and there's a couple of examples of that another one is Veronica who's the woman healed of bleeding in the gospel and one charm against bleeding you would write the name Veronica on the patient's forehead and so again that sort of identification of the patient with Veronica is supposed to give them the same outcome so the text is being used to kind of metaphorically change the material that's being written on into the thing that's being named so the patient becomes Veronica or at least receives hopefully Veronica's happy outcome yeah the thing that you've written the saint's name on becomes in some practical way a stand-in for the relic of the saint I suppose there I've started to mention some of the different things that um, that you can write these charms on so like the patient's forehead for example yeah um, so quite a few of them are written directly onto the patient's body but then there's all sorts apples cheese butter hazel twig bread into the bottom of a bowl and then you like wash it out with liquid and drink it communion wafers parchment is probably the most common one but Mm -hmm. I think the food is more funny so (laughs) I like those ones yeah I really do like the food there were a few ones that are associated with childbirth I think you were saying butter and cheese (laughs) especially yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) you always get a choice it's always butter or cheese (laughs) whatever is most available at the time I suppose Exactly, exactly. No, and I think a lot of it is to do with availability. So, for example, with the, the charms that are written on bread, all of them specify quite a standard, low-quality type of bread. They're not asking you for anything fancy. And butter and cheese, you have the option. There's a charm against bleeding where you're using the patient's blood to write onto the patient's body. And so anytime somebody is bleeding enough to require that, you know, you have the ingredients for the charm, you've got the blood, you've got the patient. So they're all they're all kind of maybe uh, apart from the communion wafers, perhaps they're all fairly ordinary household objects. Yeah. And I think that the practicality of charms really might have something that's sort of connected to relics, as you were saying as well, in that you're imbuing something with power, but it's Mm -hmm. something that is much more available than a relic. You don't have to go and try and find one or buy one. You can try and infuse a regular object, like a piece of butter, with (laughs) <laughs> not just like occult magic again, like it's not magic so much as trying to imbue it with that holiness that people are trying to access so that they can take in those benefits and and heal themselves for the most part, I think is what you were saying. Most of these are about healing. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking about that when I was reading about people writing charms in blood and it made me think about This is something that I don't know, I always associate with like pirates or something like that, writing (laughs) a contract in blood. And for me, it always seemed like this is commitment. This is you're so serious about it, you're writing in blood. But thinking about it, it probably has much more to do with adding that power that you get from a person and adding that to a charm or an agreement or something so that it has more power than it would without that blood in it. (laughs) You know what I mean? That was something that I thought was interesting because I'd always just thought of It meant you were really serious about if you're going to open a vein to write it down. (laughs) Well, yeah, and some of them, some of the ones that are written in blood are ones that would be used for for a long time. One of the ones that's often written in blood is a charm against the falling sickness, which is sort of identified with epilepsy. But so it's something that you're supposed to wear to prevent the disease. So you're wearing it for a long time. And I, I sort of wonder if the blood is adding more of an association with that particular patient. Mm -hmm. Um, You also see blood in love charms fairly often. So again, somewhere where you would really want to identify the particular person. So I wonder if there's some connection with that as well. Like the the blood makes it more personal. Yeah. But there are other things that are long-term that don't use blood. So maybe I'm (laughs) I'm wrong. (laughs) Well, I mean, it is a very precious resource. You don't want to be just just using blood for (laughs) anything because that means you'd have to get it out of you first. And that is... A whole world of problems for which you might need more charms to solve like infections so maybe it's exactly. good that it's not used all that much so when when we're talking about charms that are written in a language that is not recognizable is there anything that seems to suggest that they are being pulled from other cultures like is somebody stealing from greek i'm thinking about mirror writing and how people really love the look of 
mirror writing in Arabic and so started to put that mm -hmm. onto decorative objects and things like that. Do you find that people are borrowing from other languages just thinking that the other languages might have more power than their own? Yeah, some of them are written in a, it's a kind of fairly common magical language, these kind of characters that show up all across Europe that other scholars have argued are basically a kind of attempt to use hieroglyphs. So the, this idea that hieroglyphics have one, like one symbol has one meaning and mm -hmm. that that has magical power. But as people lose the ability to write in hieroglyphs, these kinds of made up <laughs> magical stand-ins start to appear. So you're often seeing those. I don't know whether by the time they get to medieval England, people would have understood them in that way, but they're kind of common across Europe. There are others. There's one, one set that I argue that are kind of trying to look, they're trying to look as if they are writing, maybe like lots of writing compiled on top of one another. So <laughs> they have shapes that are related to letters of the alphabet or that you could sort of look at and recognize letters of the alphabet in. They're kind of attached to one another and in, in diagrammatic forms where the shape as a whole doesn't have a clear linguistic meaning. But then you might be sort of looking at it, trying to piece that together. Some of those types of charm ask you to kind of meditate on the image. So that might be that somewhere kind of on the boundary between image and text. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you're using the letters or they're, they're telling you that you're using the other alphabets just to hide the charm from people who don't deserve <laughs> to know what it says. So there's one, one in particular where you're told to write the words of the charm in Greek so that other people can't see it. And various copies of the charm tell you different things about what needs to go into Greek. But there's at least one manuscript which tells you what the Greek should look like. So it doesn't just instruct you to write it in Greek. It says, you know, it looks like this. And it is a, a transliteration into something. It's not quite Greek. But it's that one's interesting to me because it, it doesn't mind telling the practitioner what the words mean and what they should look like. It just minds that the patient might be able to see them. You're supposed to seal the parchment. So it's got all these different layers of trying to keep the magical words or the powerful words away from somebody who might not be educated enough to understand them. And I think that one of the things that you noticed in the book is that the secretiveness of this, and we were talking about this a little bit as like a trade secret, but also the secretiveness of the charms in terms of language and stuff, you, you started to notice that happening more as the Middle Ages progressed, I think, right? Mm. Yeah, which I suspect is to do with increasing literacy. Mm -hmm. And so more of a risk that people will understand. Whereas in the earlier periods where you know, relatively few people are literate, I suspect it's easier to kind of write something down and give it to somebody and just assume that they can't use it or understand it or misuse it more importantly. <laughs> this is a, a really tricky question and there may be no way to trace it, but I'm wondering if you have a suspicion or a thought that maybe ones that were more secretive were more valued. Do you think that some people wanted to preserve that secretiveness or that sort of magic aura in it, the fact that you can't understand it? Do you think that that was more valuable to people than knowing that this just said, you know, help me, saint, whatever? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I said, how is this measurable? I don't know. But I'm just, people love magic, which is making me think that maybe they would want to not know what it says necessarily so that they can feel like it's perhaps more special. Yeah, I mean, I suspect there's an aspect to that, but then there's also some aspect of, you know, wanting to know that it will work. Yeah. So then you also have examples that are incredibly common across the whole of Europe and that you, know, you find copies of them everywhere. And so there would be things that everybody knows because everybody trusts it, I assume. So there's probably some trade-off between this is something that we all know and have all been using for ages and we all think it's helpful. And this is something that is kind of special and new and surprising and secretive. <laughs> Can you give us some examples of those ones that people are using every day? Because you do say that they're not only being used every day, but being used for hundreds of years. So can you give us an example of what people might be charming on the everyday? Every day is probably an exaggeration, but I mean, <laughs> things like, like there's a, a charm for childbirth, which has a, a list of miraculous births. Mm. It's gone straight out of my head who gave miraculous births in the Bible other than Mary, but there's a yeah. list of, you know, a few of them. And that, you know, you get, you find copies of that all over the place. There's 
the three good brothers charm. So it's got this little narrative about Christ meeting three good brothers and they say that they're going to collect herbs and he kind of says, don't worry about it, I'll give you a charm instead. Um, <laughs> and that crops up all over the place as well. There's a bleeding charm that refers to the River Jordan. That's again, very common. I've got examples of charms that in my, I think roughly 1100 that I looked at for the book, I have, you know, one copy of something. And then there's others where I have, you know, 35 copies of the same charm. And so something which is appearing that many times and would presumably have been circulating orally as well, that has to be something that's very common, very well known. Yeah, I would think so. And you mentioned at one point that these are probably as common to people as nursery rhymes. It's just something that you're hearing all the time. Yeah, I think so. I can't quite think how you would end up with so many copies of something spoken something intended to be spoken if it weren't circulating very widely and things that also things that are written down but clearly have kind of gone through a process of being spoken mm -hmm. so for example there's the the sato square so the sentence sato a repo tenet opera rotas which if you write it in a square you can read it forwards backwards up and down every direction like it's a kind of super palindrome and that sentence appears quite a lot in childbirth charms, but in later examples, quite often the spelling is wrong or the like one word will be off or something like that, which given that it has this palindromic quality, which relies on it being written out as a square to kind of get that wrong, to lose that sentence, I think it has to be circulating orally at some point. It has mm -hmm. to, you know, it's kind of coming back into writing as something that you know, gains power or is perceived as powerful because of its layout because it can go into that special layout but then has that layout is no longer important what's become important is the sound of the phrase and so people are copying it down using the sense of why it was initially powerful I think well I think that what you're getting at is something I wanted to ask about and maybe this is something we can't access as well but thinking about the ways in which you have power being brought into the body in different ways so I've talked on the podcast with other people about seeing things and that's one of the ways that you might get imbued with power or hearing things or touching them it's making me wonder because we're talking about words and the power being in the words and sort of separate power from writing and speaking and i just wondered just out of my own curiosity when you have spoken charms is there anything to suggest or that you think might suggest that breath has anything to do with it or is it just the sound like is the holiness or the the power entering just through the ears do you think or do you think that being in the presence of someone speaking it has to do with breath as another way of entering someone's body or the object or things like that i'm not sure they never specify how they think they work you do sometimes get ones that tell you to say, speak over a particular part of the body. So sometimes the part that's, you know, injured, but sometimes into, you know, like into the left ear. So it, there's, it's setting up a particular physical relationship between the person saying the charm and the patient. And so it's not just into, you know, any ear, which suggests that it isn't just the sound. Mm -hmm. I can't think of anything where they theorize it or explain it. Yeah, But the fact that some examples, it's not common, but that some examples are being specific about where the sound should go mm -hmm. um, suggests that there is a little bit more going on than, than just the words. <laughs> I mean, it's unrelated, but it's making me think about the way people talk about talking to plants <laughs> and how when you talk <laughs> to plants, you know, it's the breath, but maybe it's also the sound or maybe it's also your intentions. And so it's making me think about maybe the breath is is one of the ways that you could be passing on that power that you're trying to give to someone in order to heal them or whatever. So, you know, I know that people are not plants and that this is not the same thing, but it made me think <laughs> about, <laughs> about the different ways in which holiness, especially that's mm -hmm. been a, a large part of the discussion I've had on the podcast before with people that holiness could enter someone else's body. Mm -hmm. So for people who are interested in charms, you've, in the, the process of researching this book, collected together hundreds and hundreds of charms, and soon they'll be available to the public so people can look at them. So tell us a little bit about the database that you collected and compiled for this work. So the book is written from a database that I collected just privately on my own laptop. And that ended up being quite frustrating to use because the project changed as, as the book went on, as mm -hmm. everything always does. 
So I had kind of built the database initially and then found out that I was asking it different questions and I had set it up to answer <laughs> and that got very annoying. And so the, the new database, which is behind schedule, as I think digital humanities projects maybe always are, but the, the new database is trying to answer the questions that I ended up wanting to ask and couldn't. So one of the things that I'm trying to do with it is to make it searchable by sort of material and practice as well as by language and all kinds of other factors. Because I find that when, if we're organizing charms according to the motif, like the literary metaphor of the charm or whatever, that's not quite the right word, but you know what I mean? The imagery. If we're organizing them in that way, we're kind of prioritizing often a particular religious image. And so I think that makes it hard to tell how charms might be moving between different religions. And so one of the things that I'm sort of hoping is that if we can look up, like, show me all the charms that are written on apples, show me all the charms that involve eating the text. That's something that, like that material practice, you might be able to see more easily when there are things that are, you know, ideas that are moving between different cultures, even if the religious imagery is changing as a, a charm goes from kind of one religious setting to another. Or maybe they're not moving through at all. That would also be interesting. So I'm looking at medieval England, but my hope is that it's going to make some kind of cultural comparison easier. That would be amazing. Just to look up how many charms are, show me which charms are written on apples <laughs> would just be so <laughs> fun. And also, I think, as you say, would tell you a lot about the way that charms are interacting with each other and across cultures and with material objects. So I'm mm. looking forward to this database being finished whenever it is finished. And hopefully that will be soon, but people will just have to keep updated checking out your faculty page. I imagine you'll, you'll be able to put a link there, right? Yeah, I will. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Before we <laughs> wrap up, do you have a favorite charm that you just love telling people about when people are like, you're working on charms? Do you have one that you just like to drop because it's amazing? <laughs> There's one where you, you write on a piece of bread, write a prayer on a piece of bread and then you put it in water and your chickens eat it and then the chickens <laughs> won't get sick and I really like that one because it it so clearly doesn't involve understanding anything at all it's just the words become this kind of mushy bread and get eaten by the birds and off they go <laughs> and I think also because it feels very everyday like it's not dealing with a crisis and a lot of the other charms are you know they're for conditions that could be not very serious or could be life-threatening and so there's like a kind of apparent urgency to them. And I mean, I'm sure you wouldn't want your chickens to get sick, but <laughs> I like that it's just this kind of preventative care of the chicken. <laughs> yeah, you go to your vet, he gives you a charm. <laughs> just kidding. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> That would be a good charm to have in your back pockets, right? And something for your chickens to make sure that they're healthy. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Catherine, and talking about thank charm has been really, really wonderful. To find out more about Catherine's work, you can visit her faculty page at Nanyang Technological University. Her new book is Textual Magic, Charms and Written Amulets in Medieval England. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, well, there's been an interesting find from late last year. It was this Viking ship burial that was discovered in Norway. And that's, you know, there's been several of those. But what's interesting about this is how early it is. They used the iron rivets that they found to date it to the year about 700. Wow, that is really early. Yeah, so that's the earliest. And it kind of confirms that these Viking ship burials were taking place much earlier than we thought. And also mm -hmm. that seafaring would have been taking place much earlier than we thought, right? Yeah. So that, that's kind of an interesting piece. So we have that. We also have news about Mary, Queen of Scots. Mm -hmm. In her captivity under Elizabeth, she wrote a lot of letters. And about 57 of them had kind of a secret code in them. So it's all kind of looks like gibberish when you look at it. But a few scholars were able to decipher them. Nice. Yeah. Is it a grocery list? <laughs> yeah, it is complaining about prison captivity, you know, <laughs> and Elizabeth is not treating her well, and mm. she doesn't think she'll get released. As it turns out. Yeah. <laughs> Spoiler alert. But it's nice, it nice to kind of discover that stuff. And I think with these secret codes lately, I mean, thanks to AI and things like that, you know, we're discovering their codes a lot easier these days. And, and mm -hmm. so a nice little bit of information to come up. Nice. So we have that, plus lots of news that we're reporting on. 
In Worcester, there was a 15th century bridge that collapsed or partially collapsed. They had weeks of heavy floodwaters in the area and lots of build up of debris. I'm kind of sad that the authorities didn't clear debris from this bridge. <laughs> so now they have a much bigger problem. Oh, that's too bad. But I mean, it's inevitable at some point <laughs> that bridges are going to fall down. <laughs> indeed, indeed. It's been hanging in there for a while. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for stopping by and telling us what's on the website this week. Thanks, Peter. Thanks. Thank you to everyone who supports my work and that of other indie historians through Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Patrons have access to all sorts of amazing stuff like subscriptions to Medieval World magazine, a book club, digital downloads, and ad-free versions of Medievalist.net and this podcast. And now you can even get a digital bundle of my survival guides and my first book, The 5-Minute Medievalist, right on Patreon. To get in on all the action and support your favorite medievalists, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. And finally, thank you to everyone who has been leaving such kind reviews of my new book, Chivalry and Courtesy, online. As you know, the last couple of months have been just a smidge on the challenging side, so it's made me so happy to see that people are enjoying my work. Reviews are immensely helpful to authors and podcasters, both because they boost our place in the rankings and because people always check reviews to see what they're getting into. So I wanted to take a quick moment to share my appreciation. If you love my work and have a few seconds to spare, clicking on those little stars on your podcast app or online bookstore goes a long way to helping other people discover my books and this podcast. So thanks, everybody, for your kind words and for giving me a boost, both algorithmically and emotionally. I truly appreciate it. For everything from charms to farms, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or X at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, across social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores, where you can get hold of Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World, now out in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an amazing day. Yeah.